Well, amen. Good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Good to see each one of you. Come out, be a part of the service this evening. Thank the Lord for giving us a beautiful day. It's starting to get more towards that time of the year. Boy, I'm telling you what, the mornings and evenings are feeling a little better. I'm starting to get the itching to get out in the woods a little bit, but... Uh, Thank the Lord for giving us a beautiful day. Thank the Lord for each one of you uh, coming out and being a part of our service this evening. We're going to start off singing this chorus. Uh, actually, we'll sing all the verses of I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I have decided now to follow Jesus, and that was my fault. Miss Melissa asked me on the way up how many verses we had, and I misinformed her, so <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you for rolling with me, Miss Melissa, amen. All right, well, it is good to be in the Lord's house this evening. In case you're wondering, this is a different table. The one I normally use had a lot of stuff on it, so I just grabbed this one, so I'm a little closer to the floor tonight, so, but uh, anyway, it was a little easier to carry up. I might decide I like it, but uh, anyway. Good to be in the Lord's house this evening. I wonder if anyone have any uh, prayer requests or praise items they'd like to share with us uh, this evening. Anybody at all? Miss Jane? Please pray for my sister Florence Powers, and she lives in North Carolina. She's just not feeling good at all. Praise Miss Jane's sister, Lawrence Powers. Lord be with her. Any others? I thought I seen another hand somewhere. Brother Corey? My sister's husband, or my brother in law, Chris, uh, he's still in the hospital. He's been uh, sedated for a good week. About a year ago, I was at uh, Costco and had my eyes checked, and I was told that I had uh, cataracts and had to have they should be removed at any time. So I finally got a doctor's appointment for today and went to the doctor. And no cataracts. Uh, they started, but they're nowhere near being. Praise the Lord. And uh, uh, I just need to upgrade my old glasses. Mike, that's much better than knife in your eyeball. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, I got a prayer for uh, Stephen Pamber getting ready to have a divorce. And after 27 years, that's bad. So pray for Stephen Pamber. Pray for them. Pray for them. 
anyone else? Danny? Danny Parker does. She's no better. And she's probably not going to be in They will bust the stomach the next Tuesday. Pray for Joe. Yeah. Message to her. She told me that she uh, had it started out uh, feeling a little better this morning, but it went downhill pretty quickly. So just pray for pray for Joe. Pray for uh, Matt uh, also recovering from his surgery. Miss Gail sent me a message here. Uh, she said that he's really struggling with the recovery. He's got intense pain. His medication makes him nauseous. He can't eat or drink, and so. Uh, Matt's really going through it, and uh, so pray that the Lord uh, just help uh, Matt get over some of this pain and uh, the medicine to quit making him sick. I believe he's supposed to be on a liquid diet for about six weeks. So just pray the Lord be with Matt. That's a Matthew Clark, yes. So pray for him. Pray for him. Then uh, Miss Heather asked that we put her step-grandmother on the list. Uh, her name is Diane. She had a Leg amputated due to a diabetic ulcer, is that correct? So pray for, pray for her. Uh, also, uh, pray for Miss Lila. Her knee's giving her some trouble. She won't make that request on her own, but pray for Miss Lila. <laughs> Lord, to touch her knee and uh, help that to clear up for her. Uh, Kent and Jen are traveling, uh, so pray for them. They uh, were going to visit his family, and so... Uh, left a couple days early so they could, I think they're going to go by Hershey Park, spend a little time together with the girls, and so pray for them. They'll be back uh, Saturday evening, so pray, Lord, keep them safe as they're traveling. Pray, Lord, keep that. Anyone else? i got a couple more to share, but anything else? Anything else, Miss Heather? I forgot about my eye checker from the gate to find out if they can do anything for my peripheral vision. Because I can't see out of either of my eyes. So if you ever see me jumping, you come by and say hi. It's because I see you coming on this side. I'm almost totally deaf. Pray for that. Pray for Miss Heather. Charlie, come at me from the front. Miss Sheila. Keep Robbie in prayer. Pray for Robbie. He, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. But he... He has made it to where he was going. So he sent Miss Sheila a message and said, Hi, I'm here. Bad service. Bye. That about sums it up, don't it? <laughs> and, uh, but pray for, pray for Robbie. Keep him in prayer. Do pray for uh, those that have uh, lost loved ones. Uh, pray for the Nicely family and then the Maxine Dempsey family. And uh, a lot of times I, I don't explain all that uh, goes on, but I do want to just... First of all, apologize for not making it to that memorial service. I know that uh, Miss Dempsey related to a lot of folks here in the church. And uh, whenever I found out what time it was going to be and where it was, I'm like, boy, I don't know if I'm going to make this happen. That's the first day of, first day of school, and I'd already told uh, Billy nicely that I would go to his service here in Fairfield at 2 o'clock. And I'm like, I don't know if I can make all this happen. But I said, well, I'm going to give it a try. I'm, I'm going to give it a try. And so I dropped a... Uh, uh, Jacob off here at school and, and I hit the road, headed uh, to, the, to the service uh, for Miss Dempsey. And I was about 15 minutes away. And my phone rang and it was Robbie. And I'm like, yeah, what's up, Robbie? He said, my flight's been delayed. I'm not going to make my connecting flight at JFK. And if I don't make that connecting flight, I'm not going to make it to uh, Florida in time to catch the mission group to go to Peru. And I'm like, hang on, let me pull off the road. So I pull off the road, and I uh, get on my phone, and I start looking, and I, I find a flight and I, that would go straight from Richmond, where he was, to um, Miami. And so I called him back, and I said, Robbie, Spirit Airlines has a direct flight from Richmond to Miami. It'll get you there in time. Do you see a Spirit Airline desk? And he's like, yes, I do. I said, go talk to him. And I hop back on the road, and I'm making my way on to the service, you know, heading that way. And my phone rings again, and it's Robbie. And he said, we're too close. They, they said, we have to book this that flight at least an hour in advance, and we were only like 30 minutes from the flight. It's not going to work. So I'm driving up the road talking to Robbie on my phone, and I didn't hear my navigation that was on my phone as well. And so I'm just trucking on up the road, headed to the funeral, talking to Robbie. I pull off the road again, 
I called the director. Anyway, long story short, I ended up back and forth making calls for about 30 minutes. Um, finally, we got Robbie a flight. It's all settled. And it was about 20 minutes after 11 at this time. And I looked at my GPS, and uh, I was about 40 minutes from the church because I had missed my turn, and I was, I was on my way to Bedford but making tracks. <laughs> and so uh, I said, you know what, I believe I just need to head back to Fairfield. And so not at all trying to make excuse, but letting you see that I, I tried. I gave it my best shot, and so I knew that uh, she was related to a lot of you, and I wanted to be there, but I felt like I really needed to get Robbie to Peru. He had a lot of uh, investment in that, and praise the Lord, he did make it. Uh, every flight that he caught was delayed, and the flight leaving Miami to go to Columbia left at 9.30, and his, his uh, flight landed at 8.45. So, I mean, he was jumping out of one plane and jumping on the other. So he cut it close, but the Lord did bless, and he was there. And I just, just felt like it would just be best if I just be honest to share with you. I was doing my best to be there, and just circumstances were such that it didn't happen. And so, anyway, pray for the Ms. Maxine Dempsey and that family and everyone that's uh, related to her. Pray that the Lord will be with them. Also, Miss Lila's aunt, Miss Mildred Snyder, passed away yesterday. So she passed away yesterday. So pray, pray for that family. The service is tomorrow, a graveside service tomorrow morning. So pray for that family as well. Anyone else? Anyone else? My sister and the girls, actually they were delayed in Arizona because kept, the bus kept breaking up. Somehow got worth it. They got back to Harrisburg one time somehow because they didn't have the extra day of travel they thought they would. And they're at my uh, stepsister's grandmother's house staying and stuff. And they're just trying to get all the information because he kept their social security cards and stuff and IDs. So... They have to do that all over again, and then they have to go back in the school because the oldest one is autistic. Well, let's pray. So she said, just continue praying God works things out that they can stay there and that she doesn't have to serve any time because of her probation. Because he had forced her to go to California and never see her girls. Let's pray the Lord work that situation out. Do keep that in prayer. And she says, thank you to everybody for praying because it's worked out so far and she's starting to get her. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Let's pray for that. Pray for that. I do have a couple of praise items to share uh, just before we uh, get into our lesson tonight. Uh, one is Brother Mike Shaw called me yesterday, and as you know, after he had the lump removed, they sent it off to test it and make sure there was no cancer in it. He called me yesterday and said, absolutely 100% cancer-free. So praise the Lord. No cancer at all, Brother Shaw was clear of cancer, so we praise the Lord for that. And then Brother Ted had a praise item he shared with me tonight. And he told me not to share it with y'all, but I understand where Brother Ted is at. Not exactly, but I can relate. But uh, Brother Ted said, praise the Lord, Jeff Peanut Butter is back on the shelf. And so <laughs> he is rejoicing now. I told him, I said, you probably don't even think, don't think that I understand because I like Peter Pan, you know, but uh, I do like my peanut butter. And boy, I'm telling you what, if they know peanut butter in the cupboard, I'm hurting. So uh, praise the Lord, the peanut butter's back. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. <laughs> What's that? I ain't half that bad peanut butter before I seen the recall. It didn't hurt you at all? We had a big tub Amen. Amen. Anything else before we get into our lesson tonight? Anyone at all? Yes, sir. Little baby Larry is working. Request for prayer for is not going well at all. We just need to pray. Oh, let's pray for that. Pray for that little baby. Ventilator, they can't get her off the ventilator. They're still optimistic that they they can help them, but it will be a long, long road. Yeah. Just pray for that family. Let's pray for that. Let's, let's pray for that family for sure. Pray for them. Miss Jane? Hi, Matt Kugler. Matt. Um, we talked to his mother on Monday, and he's in the hospital. She's got a bad headache. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to pray for him. Let's pray for him. Pray for that family. Anyone else? Anyone else? Miss Bonnie? Unspoken. Unspoken. Miss Bonnie. Please have your chest pain while you're actually over at 
has tracked up, but in the last couple of days or so, he's been okay to sleep. It's a lot like when you just rest as much as you want. Don't worry about it. But the doctor said he seemed fine, but he thinks it might have been a nerve going about my sister or something. He's either lost size or he's it's a deformity had like a V like John had. And they did say that probably as a result he will end up having to have a pacemaker because he's already experiencing the pains and stuff. But he's allowed to do exercise or whatever. He just has to stay hydrated and then he's a great day. Well, praise the Lord. Glad that Sammy's doing well. Hey, man. Uh, Terry? Uh, something simple. Just, we all got concerns. We all got problems. We think back to that conference to simplify the goodness of God. Hey, man. Hey, man. It's just a blessing. We sometimes take for granted the goodness of God. Yeah. That's it right. Miss Amy? <clears throat> the little boy Samuel, I say little boy, but he's 18 years old. Um, he's just a couple days out from his stem cell transplant. Um, he's having lots of nausea. And it's kind of sad right now in the cancer world. Um, the medicines that they need are hard to get. Um, we just, I couldn't imagine my kid fighting cancer and the medicines not being available um, that they need. So just pray for Samuel because he's having a lot of uh, nausea. Um, we have some little girls that ride my bus that come uh, to church. Their, I didn't realize that their baby brother has to have a bunch of throat surgeries and stuff. Um, and I cannot think of his name for the life of me, but it's Summer and Elizabeth's little baby brother. Uh, he's got two more surgeries coming up, so pray for him. Uh, pray for my cousin Jean. She's uh, going through a, a tough spot in her life right now. Uh, it's Amy Lee's daughter, so you know, Amy Lee kind of wishes that she could be home to help my cousin, but maybe we can get my cousin to come down and or something, you know. Um, our house closes September 12th. Was praying closed? Praying, so, um, yeah. Right. Let's pray for each of these. All right, we'll go ahead and get into our lesson. And, of course, if you think of something that uh, you failed to say, we'll give you a moment to share that uh, before we uh, close with a season of prayer. Continuing this study on developing your personal Bible study. And uh, so last week we started looking at this thing of figures of speech. And so we're going to continue looking at these different figures of speech and uh, boy, I tell you what, there is a lot in here. The one of them that we'll be looking at tonight, the first one we'll be looking at tonight is paradox. And uh, I went down, was having lunch with Melissa at lunchtime, and I told her, I said, I could preach for a year on paradoxes in the Bible. I mean, as I studied it, it was just one thing after another. I'm like, wow, this is some tremendous stuff. Don't worry, I won't try to cover all that tonight. But uh, boy, I'm telling you what, there's some good stuff in here. But 2 Timothy 2.15 uh, is the passage of Scripture we're using as our foundation for this study. Of course, we'll be looking at several other Scriptures tonight as we look at these different figures of speech. But 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I pray that through this uh, Bible study that we do develop the desire, the hunger to dig into the Word of God, to study the Word of God. You know, whenever you do not spend much time in the Word of God, uh, maybe you uh, read a, a, a devotional or a portion each day, the statistics say that only about 10% of professing Christians actually read their Bible every day, and then of those, there's even a smaller percentage that reads any substantial amount of Scripture. And so uh, if you don't read your Bible or you only read it occasionally or something like that, whenever you get it out and begin to read it, you're not familiar with it, you're not familiar with the language, you're not familiar with how it's written, and it can honestly be a chore to get much of it read at all. But the more you read it, 
the more you get in it, the more you study it, the more you understand it, the more familiar you become with it, you will find that the easier and easier and easier it gets to just drink in the Word of God. And so it's my prayer through this study that we're doing on Wednesday nights to develop in you a hunger to dig in, to get acquainted with the Word of God. We had our first night of uh, Faith Bible Institute Monday night and uh, Brother Gates made a couple of statements that I said, boy, I need to use these on Wednesday nights. But one of them, he was talking about uh, memorization. And he said that early Christians, now we're not talking about the Jews, the early Jews memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, but the early Christians, by the time they were 12 years old, could quote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They would teach their children and they would rehearse and rehearse until by the time they were 12 years old, they could quote the four Gospels. Uh, I read of a Bible school that this uh, preacher, he wanted to train preachers, but the, the men that were surrendered and willing to preach uh, couldn't read. They had no education, couldn't read, and so he opened a Bible school. And what they did in the Bible school was, I think it was a year long or something like this, they memorized Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And once they had the Gospels memorized, they sent them out to start preaching, and they took and went and told the story of Jesus. And so uh, I think that in our day, we lack that hunger for the Word of God. And I can only imagine how much it would change our lives if we were to be that acquainted with the Word of God. The other thing that Pastor, uh, Pastor Yates said that I, I said, man, I like that statement. He said that a lot of times folks will complain about the preacher. They'll say the preacher, he always just, you know, just preaching simple stuff, just milk. I wish the preacher would preach some of the meat of the Word. Brother Yates said, when you get to meat, it's time to pick up your own knife and fork. And so that's what we're trying to encourage you in this to do. Pick up your own knife and fork and dig in to the meat of the Word. So anyway, enjoy in this study. Enjoy in uh, what the Lord has for us. So let's pray and then we'll get into the lesson. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your Word. And Father, Lord, the more we dig into it, Lord, it's like a gold mine. Lord, with each shovel, Lord, there's more to be found. There's more truth. And Lord, it's evident that the Word of God is alive. Any other book of this age would have been outdated centuries ago. But Father, it's still relevant. It still applies. We can still live by it. It's still accurate. And Father, I thank you that you have given us your Word. Lord, so many times throughout life we encounter people who wish they had a manual. They wish they had a book. They wish they had instruction that would tell them how to handle uh, situations in life. But Father, you have given us that book. And Father, I pray that we'll not let such a valuable resource just sit on the shelf and collect dust while we fumble our way through life. But Lord, as your children, we will apply ourselves to your book that, Lord, it might make a difference in us and who we are and how we live. Father, I pray. Thank you for your goodness to us. Bless now as we look at these figures of speech and look at these applications. I pray, dear Lord, that it will help us to gain understanding of your word and, Father, what it means to be a student of the word of God. And, Father, we thank you for it. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, as we get into this, uh, Brother Hot Rod, we may go through some of the first slides quickly to get to where we're at. Uh, so you may even just want to skip down there a little bit. Uh, but we started looking at figures of speech. Figures of speech is recognizing and understanding figurative statements in the Bible and the purpose they serve. So throughout the Word of God, there are figurative statements. The Bible is a literal book, but it's written in common language. And in common language, we regularly use figures of speech. Therefore, figures of speech are in the Word of God. It doesn't mean that the Bible is not a literal book, but we need to understand these figures so that we can understand the literal interpretation of the book that God has given us. And so last week we looked at uh, three uh, figures of speech. Uh, you see I filled them in there on your worksheet for you. Uh, they are the simile, the metaphor, and the allegory. Probably the most uh, common of figures of speech that we looked at last week. Now this week we're going to continue looking and Hopefully we're going to get three more uh, out off of this list, but we're going to be looking at three more figures of speech that I believe as we understand them, it helps us to better understand 
the Word of God. The first one that we're going to look at tonight, uh, which will actually be number four on your worksheet, is paradox, a paradox. Uh, I have a definition there for you on the right side of your worksheet. A paradox uh, is a seeming contradiction that when properly understood may prove true. So a seeming contradiction that when you understand it, although it seems to contradict itself, uh, when you understand it, it may prove true. The Bible uses paradox at times to explain or explore the full scope uh, or, or all the nuances of the truth that is being presented. Sometimes uh, in order to understand a full meaning, we have to leave the literal words in order to get a full meaning. And you will see this as we go on. Now many passages of Scripture Scripture, there have been people who have taken passages of Scripture and highlighted them, and we'll look at a couple examples of this, and said this shows that there are errors in the Word of God. Here is a mistake, here is an error, here is something that is wrong, and they point them out, which many times when we look at them, they're not errors, they're not contradiction, they're paradoxes, and whenever you look at it in its entirety, it makes sense. There are some common examples of paradoxes that we use in our everyday conversation. Uh, some common examples of things we'll say. I have them there on your worksheet. Uh, one is less is more. Have you ever heard folks say that? Less is more. Now in a literal sense, less is not more. But whenever we look at it in the way that we use it, many times the abundance of things that we have become overwhelming and we don't get much out of life and so less gives us more out of life. So it's a paradox that we use often and we understand what it means. Uh, uh, another one that I have here, uh, this is called the liar's paradox because it's, it's a paradox that you just can't make sense of. It says, this statement is false. This statement is false. Now, if this statement is false, then it's not true, right? But, but if it is false, it is true. It's a confusing statement. It's a paradox. There's no sense to be made out of this. They say it's the liar's paradox because you can never make sense out of it. Another one that a liar would say that it's hard to make sense out of is if someone was to say, I always lie. So is this a lie? And that means he always tells the truth? Or, or is he telling the truth this time about the fact that he always lies? So you see how these are paradoxes, and those are just funny ones. Another one uh, that would uh, be more true to what we find in the Word of God is this one. I can resist anything but temptation. I can resist anything but temptation. By making this statement, the, the writer is driving home the weakness of his flesh. Uh, he's saying, I am strong. No, I am weak. And the paradox drives that truth home. Another example of paradox that would be familiar with those of us who attend church is found in the song Amazing Grace. We sing it any time we sing Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote these words, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." How is it possible that grace can both teach me to fear and relieve me of fear. It's a paradox, but when you understand grace, uh, it makes perfect sense. And so we see that a paradox has is something that appears uh, to be a contradiction, but when you understand it, uh, it proves true and actually solidifies uh, the truth. The Bible has many examples of this figure of speech throughout its pages. One of the most famous paradoxes found in Scripture, which you'll be very familiar with, maybe you've not thought of it as a paradox, uh, but that is the Trinity. The Trinity is a paradox. The Bible says that there is one true God, only one God. Yet we understand that that God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And there are those who do not understand the Word of God and do not understand the doctrine of the Trinity who question the Word of God because of that very thing. They'll say, your Bible says you have one God, but yet your Bible names three gods. You see, they are only one true God, and we could branch off here into a, a series on the Trinity, and we're not here to teach on the Trinity tonight. But we look into the Word of God, and what seems to be a contradiction proves true in the study of the Word of God. 
Uh, there's other examples of paradox in the Bible uh, that occur in the same verse. And I'm just going to go through a few of them here, and then in a moment we'll look at the two that's on your worksheet. Uh, uh, some of these verses, when we read them, they seem to contradict themselves. Uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number, uh, chapter number 6, verse 4, down through verse number 10, I'll give you a moment if you want to flip over there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, you may want to follow along with this. And we see here Paul uh, giving some paradoxes. In 2 Corinthians 6 and in verse number 4, Paul talking here, he says, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And then he lists several things. If you drop down to verse number 8, he's continuing. But here he begins sharing the paradox. He says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report, and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Uh, now at first glance this passage of scripture is very confusing because it contradicts itself over and over and over throughout the passage. But it doesn't take long of a study of the rest of the word of God to understand what Paul is saying here. And by using the paradox he drives home uh, the breadth uh, of what it means to be a minister of the gospel. In Philippians 3 and verse number 7 Paul said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss... Uh, for Christ again, what seemed like I was where I seemed like I was gaining, where I was improving, I counted them as loss for Christ. Second Corinthians chapter number twelve, and in verse number ten, I'll try to go a little slower if y'all want to turn to the Second Corinthians twelve and verse number ten. Paul says here, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. Catch this last phrase. For when I am weak, then am I strong. In a literal sense, this makes no sense. But understanding the figure of speech of a paradox, Paul is driving home the importance of relying on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the paradox makes it so clear the truth that Paul is driving home. In Proverbs, back in the book of Proverbs chapter number 11, we find another verse that is again a, a contradiction at first glance. In Proverbs 11 verse 24, it says, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. Here Solomon is teaching the truth uh, of the generous heart and how that if you give, God will give back. Now if you don't believe in God, this verse makes no sense to you at all. But if you believe in the God of the Bible, you see exactly what's being taught here. I can give away and God will give back of me. Each of these verses uh, contrast an earthly view with a heavenly view. You see, as Christians, we're not just people. We have both a physical characteristic here on this earth uh, and we have a spiritual characteristic. Uh, we have an outward physical being and an inner spiritual being. And every one of these verses are representing both my outward physical and my inner spiritual. And when I understand that I have both body, soul, and spirit, these verses make perfect sense. But if you try to take them in a literal sense, they make no sense. And so we see how that this figure of speech does not take away from the literal interpretation of the Word of God, but instead the author, God, who understands language better than anyone, is employing figures of speech to teach us important spiritual truths. Now there's some other examples of paradox in the Bible uh, that are found in separate passages. And when I said that there are folks who point out contradictions in the Word of God, they may go to some of these verses. There's many more than what I have here. Uh, I just have a few to share with you. I'll go through them quickly just for sake of time. In Romans 3.28, the Bible says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. James 2 verse number 24 says, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified 
and not by faith only. This seems to directly contradict one another. Romans says you're justified by faith, not works. James says you're justified by works, not faith. You see why I say I could preach a year on these paradoxes? I mean, there is a lot of stuff here that we could dig deep into each one of these. We see here what looks like a contradiction. But whenever we study both of these texts in their entirety, we understand that it is showing us both sides of our justification. In John 12 and verse number 47, Jesus said, For I came not to judge the world. In John 9, 39, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world. Boy, it seems like a contradiction, but with a study of both scriptures, it makes perfect sense. Matthew eleven thirty, Jesus said, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we go to Luke 13, 24 and it says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. And so we see here that here are verses that seem to contradict one another, but they are in no way contradictory when we understand the whole of the Word of God. There are many people who point these out as contradictions, but not only that, there are many people who are stumped in their Christian growth because they see things like this and rather than dig into them, get out their knife and fork and find out the whole of the Word of God, they become confused and they stop growing. And so we see here that it seems... uh, to be a contradiction. We find many other paradoxes in the Bible. We find the virgin birth. We find justified sinners. We find rich poor men. We find happy mourners. And we could go on and on and on. The Bible is full of things. Why is it so that the Bible is full of things like this? Because this is a miracle book. And it takes what seems to be and makes it what it can be through the power of God. The use of paradox in the Word of God can be confusing. But whenever we understand them, we recognize that these paradoxes reveal and explain all the faucets of the wonderful doctrine that is found in the Word of God. Whenever you have a book as in-depth and as complex and as well put together as this book is, it's going to take a little digging to find the truth of the Word of God. And we see that the Lord uses paradox to reveal these. These paradoxes in Scripture calls us to take time to reflect. It makes us stop and study. For example, how many people, especially unchurched people, have you heard, quote, the verse, judge not, lest you be judged? How many have you heard, quote, that? Many, many, many people, oh, they'll tell you, judge not, especially if they're living in sin. Judge not. Bible says judge not, judge not. Boy, they'll grab that verse and run crazy with it. And they really have no understanding at all what they're talking about. You see, you've got to get into the Word of God. And whenever we come across verses that seem to contradict one another, it makes me stop and dig in. And whenever I dig in, then I understand what the Bible is teaching when it teaches me both that I am not to judge people, but yet I am to judge people. And it makes sense. And the paradox forces me to reflect. It makes me take time and look into the meaning of certain passages. It makes me investigate the truth. And in the end, the paradoxes bring me to a better understanding of this blessed old book. It helps me dig in to the Word of God. Now there's two examples that I gave you there on your worksheet. Uh, They are 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 6. And we'll try to look at these just briefly. But in 1 Timothy 5, 6, the Bible says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now this is a definite paradox. It says that she that liveth is dead while she liveth. This does not work in a literal sense. It seems contradictory. But with a little word study, if you remember a couple weeks ago we were doing some word studies, with a little bit of word study and we look up this word pleasure, we understand that this word pleasure here refers to someone who is given over to a life of excess and wantonness. Someone who is who is trying to experience a all that this physical world has to offer. Now this passage of Scripture here in uh, 1 Timothy is speaking of widows. 
And it's speaking of uh, the responsibility of taking care of widows and responsibility of children, nephews, uh, and then the church to care for widows. And then the Lord is explaining widows and, and who is to be cared for. And in verse number 6, he said, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. If we back up to verse number 5, we see that the Bible says, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So here's a widow who is trusting God. She's spending time in prayer. She is seeking the Lord. She's following after the Lord. Uh, uh, this lady is someone that will be blessed. She'll be taken care of. People will care for her. He said, but in verse number 6, is she's living in excess and wantonness, and she's just went back to the world, and she's trying to experience everything that the world has. This woman is going to be dead spiritually even though she is alive. And you see how the paradox drives home the truth of, of that someone who lives a life in pursuit of the things of this world will be dead to the things of God. And although it's applied to widows here, it can apply to every person. If you live in pursuit of the things of this world, you're going to be dead to the things of God. You cannot do both. The second example that we have here under paradox is Matthew 16, 25. It says here, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. This is a verse that we refer to often. We've all heard messages preached on this, perhaps many messages. But I'm telling you, the weight of this verse is something that I don't think I think very few people fully understand what this verse means. As we've been reading the missionary st stories uh, uh, on each service this month, and we read of these men who gave up everything, lost their families, lost their wealth, lost their careers so that they could go tell somebody about Jesus. I believe that is somebody that's losing his life for the sake of the Savior. Whosoever will save his life. In other words, whoever is focused on me and making sure that I get the best of everything and I have everything I need and everything I want and I'm focused on taking care of me. Whoever's focused on me is going to lose his life. You see, because we're eternal beings and the time that we have here on earth is just a very short amount of time that was given to us to prepare us for eternity. We are eternal beings. Our real life doesn't start until we check out of this life. Uh, our real life doesn't begin until we step uh, into the portals of eternity. And whosoever will save his life here in this life is going to ultimately lose his life uh, in eternity. Seems contradictory, but the paradox drives home how important it is that we give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second figure of speech, and I'm going to try to hurry. I'm determined that we're going to get all three of these tonight. So Y'all might have to put on your fast listening ears here. But the second figure of speech that we're going to look at tonight, uh, is, which is number five on your overall list, uh, and that is the figure of speech of irony. Uh, the definition of irony is the expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite. Uh, we, it says typically for humorous or emphatic effect. Uh, the Bible uses irony at times to bring attention uh, and clarity to a situation. The most recognizable form of irony in our daily conversation is that of sarcasm. And now some of us uh, are much more uh, gifted in the gift of sarcasm than others. Uh, but there are some of us, boy, I mean, they just, they just you know, Brother Terry, they, <laughs> they just have the gift of, oh, they could just pick on you and just give you a hard time and, you know, just go on about it. Uh, Brother Terry and Brother C, they pick on Miss Melissa all the time. And, and it's, it's irony. It's irony. We, she knows that they don't mean it in an ill way, but they're giving her a hard time picking on her. That's, that's irony. But it's some other perhaps less uh, potentially offensive, not that anyone's ever been offensive, offended here in this group about what I'm talking about, but uh, some other examples of irony that we use in our conversation would, would be whenever we say something opposite to drive home just how bad the situation is. For example, let's say that we were planning on having an outreach service here at the church and, and we had did a lot of advertising and we had had a lot of response and a lot of folks had said that they were coming and I walked in the door at 7 o'clock and there was only three people in the building. And I looked at whoever was here, and I said, boy, we got a crowd tonight, don't we? No, there's no crowd. 
<laughs> but my me saying that we have a crowd instead of saying there's only a few makes the statement stronger. Makes the statement stronger. Uh, uh, this is one that I do often, and that is you, you make a mistake, and you say, what's the matter with you, genius? Why did you do that? You call yourself a genius when really you're not a genius at all. You know, it's irony. Uh, uh, another one that's really good is um, the old blue bus out here. If you've never ridden the old blue bus, this doesn't make as much sense to you. But to refer to that old blue bus as fast, you know, <laughs> it just it don't work. Now, I have told people, I, I had it over here getting it inspected, and... Uh, uh, <clears throat> over here at the station, and he said uh, something about uh, the bus and how fast it was, or the bus and how it ran, or something. And I said, "Yeah, she's quick, boy." I mean, <laughs> but uh, it's not fast at all. Matter of fact, when I went and got my CDLs in the uh, in the bus, I uh, pulled out onto the interstate. The, the lady told me go up the exit, get on the interstate, and I pulled up on the interstate, and it was just a gradual incline. It wasn't steep at all, and uh, we had went about a mile. And the instructor, she said to me, she said. You can go ahead and take it up to speed whenever you like. <laughs> I said, ma'am, it's been on the floor since we got on the highway. This is all it's got. We're not going any faster. And so uh, these are irony. It, it, you say the opposite of what is true to make drive the point home. Several different types of irony are found in Scripture. Just a few of them they'll point out. Uh, you may want to jot these down if you have space there. Uh, in the Scripture, you'll find divine irony, divine irony. This is when the speaker is God himself. So you may find irony in the scripture where God is the speaker. In Judges 10 and verse number 14, we find an example of this. Uh, God says, go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Here God is saying to those worshiping false gods, he said, go, go to your gods. Let them deliver you. Let them listen to you knowing that false gods can't hear or deliver. Uh, there's also deceptive irony. This is when the words are clearly false and hypocritical. Uh, we find that Satan used this in Genesis chapter number 3 when he told Eve, ye shall be as God knowing good and evil, both deceptive and hypocritical. The third type of irony that we find is human irony. Uh, this is irony found in Scripture when the speaker is human. So the speaker is human, and this is both examples on your worksheet or examples of human irony found in the Word of God. The first one is in 1 Kings chapter number 18 and in verse number 27. Here in this chapter we find the story of Elijah going up against the prophets of Baal. And Elijah goes up against the prophets of Baal and he says, what we're going to do is we're going to pray to our God, whichever one answers in fire, that will know that is the true God. And then Elijah very graciously said, y'all go first. And uh, I believe Elijah planned it that way. He was looking forward to having some fun. You know, he had full confidence that his God would come through. And they tried and tried. They cried aloud. They yelled. They cut themselves with knives. Uh, they did everything they could to get their false God's attention. And then in verse number 27, it says, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. Uh, Elijah just claimed makes fun of their false god by presenting that perhaps he's busy. This is irony, human irony found in the word of God. And Elijah, by using irony, drove home just how ineffective that false god was. It's completely ineffective. The second example we find of irony uh, that we're going to look at tonight is in Job 12 and verse number 2. And here Job, you know the story of Job. Satan wanted to test Job. Job is in a miserable condition. His friends come. I'm glad y'all were better friends to me than Job's friends was to him. Here comes Job's friends. And they come and they sit around him and they begin to tell him all the reasons that God is judging him. And Job tries to reason with them. Job's like, but I've not sinned. I've not done anything wrong. I, I understand what you're saying. And many times tribulation does come because of sin, but I've not sinned. I, I've, not, I've not did anything wrong, but they continued. And so in Job 12 and verse number 2, Job responds to his friends. And he says, no doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. 
Now, Job did not believe this about his friends at all, he, and he goes on to point that out. But he started off, he was trying to drive home to them that they didn't have all the answers by using irony and saying, no doubt you have all the answers when clearly that was not what Job's thought. Now, sadly, we find that Job's uh, his irony didn't help his friends at all, and they continued to accuse Job wrongfully until God spoke up. And you know what? There's a good example to be learned there that a lot of times we continue in our own self-righteousness until God speaks up. Boy, people may try to help us. People may try to instruct us, and we're convinced that we are right. But whenever God speaks up, we tend to hush. The Bible tells us there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord regardless of what people have said their whole life. The third figure of speech that we'll look at this evening, we'll try to finish up really quickly here, and that is that of personification. That would be number six on your worksheet, personification. Personification is the use of personal descriptions for impersonal things attributing personal characteristics to impersonal entities. Uh, some common examples of personification, and I'm sure most of y'all probably do this, you call your vehicle a he or a she. Uh, many of us even name our automobiles. They have names that we go by. Now, uh, my dad, uh, his trucks were always she's, and so my trucks have always been girls too, you know. Come on, girl, come on, you can do this. and You know, that's the way, but Melissa... So all her vehicles are he's. That's all her vehicles are he's. And so there's always a conflict when I'm driving one of her vehicles and she's with me. And I'm like, come on, you can do a girl. And she's like, it's a he. Um, she always has to straighten me out on that. But this is, this is personification. When we give a, a, a personal uh, characteristic to something that is uh, impersonal, uh, sometimes we describe the wind as whispering. Now, this is something that people do. But we'll describe the wind as whispering. Uh, sometimes we'll describe the land. We even find this in the Word of God, the land as mourning. Land doesn't mourn, but we find this personification. Uh, sometimes we'll speak of flowers being kissed by the dew. Now we know that's not what's actually happening, but it helps us to understand the connection. And so these are just some common examples of personification. This figure is found in Scripture in many different ways. Uh, uh, it's found in Scripture when the absent are spoken of as being present, when the dead are spoken of as being alive, or when anything is addressed as a person. There are six uh, places where you'll find this pretty often in Scripture. Uh, you'll find members of the human body uh, being personified, such as the, the hand, uh, the eye, the tongue. We'll look at the hand in one of our examples here in just a moment. Uh, we find it being used of animals, uh, uh, given uh, human characteristics. So we find it spoken of the products of the earth. Uh, we'll see things where fruit, uh, grass, trees, oil are given human attributes. Uh, inanimate things such as uh, arrows, swords, stones, stars, uh, uh, blood, many other things are given human characteristics, uh, kingdoms and countries, uh, human actions. Uh, we'll look at one of these in just a moment. Mercy, truth are given human attributes, judgment, iniquity. We could go on and on and we see that many things are given uh, human classification. This is the figure of speech known as personification. The two examples that we have on your worksheet are Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 3. The Bible says there, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Now we know this verse. Many of us have uh, quoted this verse many times and we understand exactly what the Bible is talking about. Now my right hand and my left hand do not have the ability to think individually or even separate from the mind that controls the whole body. We understand that. But by using this personification the Bible drives home a very important truth about us seeking our own glory for the things we do for the kingdom of God. He said, don't, don't go around bragging about it. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand doing. The personification drives that truth home. Another example is, that, is in Psalm 85 and verse number 10 where the Bible says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, righteousness and peace are not physical, 
Righteousness and peace have never kissed one another. But we see a personification here of mercy and truth and righteousness and peace that makes it clear that righteousness and peace abide together in harmony. And you know what? I've, I've read this verse. I've preached on this verse. But until I was studying this figure of speech and this personification, did I make the click that righteousness, the Bible is teaching me that righteousness and peace, not only do they go together, not only are they in the same house, they are intimate. In other words, if I live a righteous life, it will be a life of peace. You say, hold on, Pastor John. What about those who've lived righteously and they've suffered persecution? Let me explain. Peace in the heart with God will far outweigh any level of peace we will ever find on this earth. And the reason those Christians were able to suffer persecution from this world is because they had the peace of God in their heart. Those that cannot face tribulation are those that do not have any righteousness and therefore they have no peace and they cannot face it. Righteousness and peace, they live together. They are one and the same in that they live together in harmony. They have kissed one another. And the personification, the word kiss, makes that truth so much more applicable. Many more examples of these can be found. Each of them are important to understand the Word of God. And many times whenever we go through the Word of God, we'll come across something that at surface doesn't make sense. But if we simply understand our own language and figures of speech, we can apply it to the Word of God that God has written in a common language and it makes so much more sense and opens up the Word of God to us. So I pray that you uh, dig in, dig in to the Word of God and begin searching these things out and seeing the truth that God has for us. Next week we're going to be looking at the next two and what these next two are. The next two, let me read the words to you. Anthropomorphism and anthropopathy. So those are the ones you'll be learning about next week. See if you can look those up in the dictionary. So anyway, I'm, a, I'm excited about them. They're some, definitely some good truths. I almost told you what they were, and I'm like, nope, I better hold off. We're out of time. So anyway, you look those up, and we'll be looking at those next week. All righty, we're going to close in a season of prayer, but just before we do, I wonder if anybody thought of a request that they want to share just before we close. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? All right. Brother Corey, would you mind taking us Lord in prayer? And then Brother Warren, would you close us in prayer?